chain link fence that separated Nana's yard from one of the side neighbors. It hung there, wedged into the diamond opening of the fence. I fell to my knees laughing. They would have gone over at least two houses, he protested. I just laughed harder. What the fuck? The shrill accusation shot eyes through every vertebra of my spine. What the fuck are you doing? Josh and I whipped around, and in the security of our preternatural link, we knew we were boned. Get inside right fucking now, my grandmother screamed, margarita in hand, tiptoeing down the concrete patio from the sliding door in her Denver Broncos slippers. I stepped toward her slowly, head bowed. The funny thing about psychic power is that it's a fragile thing at the best of times and inconsistent at the worst. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Josh running around the other side of the house, fumbling at the chain link gate with shaking hands. I wish I had thought of that. Josh had snuck in through the garage and called his parents while Nana was building. Well, Nana was busy asking me why I was such a jackass. You better hope you didn't do any damage, little boy, she'd said. I saw Josh from the living room window, pacing to and fro a few houses down on the other side of the street. Uncertain of his invisibility, Eventually, he hopped into a silver minivan and was gone without a goodbye. The end. Woo! Uh, thanks so much, Tristan. That was great. All right, we have Michael Brown next. And Michael, I don't see a bio for you, but I wondered if you wanted to introduce yourself. Oops, I can't hear you. Val, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me now? I sure can. Hi, thank, thank you. My name's Michael Brown. Um, I'm a retired Unitarian Universalist minister. I've been retired for about a year. And this is a new kind of writing for me. So I, I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm gonna start with a little uh, excerpt from an old text called the Gospel of Thomas, which is one of the Gnostic Gospels, if, if you've ever heard of them. Uh, I ran across this and I thought maybe it speaks to writers. Mm. So here's just a short little thing. It says, if you bring what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So I'm going to read a piece uh, of mine, and it's about an afternoon in Spain, and it's called The Center. The Plaza Real in Barcelona, like all other plazas, is the center of the universe. Spacious but intimate like a home, it has room enough for four or five cafes around the edges, the omnipresent fountain of life in the center, and inviting openness in between the center and the edges. On this day, it is sunny like most days in Spain, and the warm rays are enlivening his bare arms and face. The afternoon in the plaza is alive with people, but not crowded. Family singles and groups are walking and talking together, while kids are running around all over the plaza. He can hear their laughing, giggling, and squeals of intense fun rippling through the air. They seem like sparks of a universe expressing delight in its own existence. Hearing their shouts of joy, a sense of lightheartedness comes over him. Plaza Real means royal plaza but his active English speaking mind enjoys the idea that it's a real plaza too, a place where life is real. Do thoughts create physical sensations? Yes, thoughts are connected to body parts, nerve endings, facial expressions, and muscles. Meditation te techniques are all about this interconnection. relaxation this totally real yet dreamlike setting. His heart seems to quiet down. There's nothing to worry about in this moment. 
It feels unusual, but also natural. The street lamps designed by Barcelona's beloved architect Antonin Gaudí lend an air of elegance to the plaza, an aura of uniqueness of times gone by, of both charm and brilliance. The kids chase each other at top speed around the lampposts, unaware of their artistic fame. Tourists, both with and without backpacks, pause to gaze at the street lamps, consult their guidebooks, then scan the whole plaza scene, deciding what to check out next. It is somehow soothing just to sit and watch and to watch The cafe is like many others, inviting but not flashy. A cafe con leche will be perfect for this setting. The slightly bitter yet sweet creamy liquid creates an experience of sensual awakening in his mouth. A familiar taste, but also completely new, intensified by the sunny plaza and its compelling aliveness. The delight of the drink descends through his upper body like a healing elixir spreading a meditative warmth to his inner organs. Who are these other people sharing the small table with him? To all appearances, they seem to be family members, a spouse and two teenage boys. Actually, one of them seems like a young adult. They each sip their own drinks and the four of them talk from time to time. Only please to be where they are and not to be in a hurry. He is at peace with each and all of them this moment. He does not feel the inner tension or the tightness of his torso that sometimes accompany their family squabbles. The plaza, the sun, the children, and the coffee seem to have neutralized all that. He feels completely content with their presence together sensing that they somehow belong in this setting. They are all part of a larger experience taking place in the plaza on this sunny afternoon. He feels a sense of joy coming over him, a peaceful yet intense joy that relaxes his muscles and brings a spontaneous smile to his face. Rarely has life felt this complete to him. He has no right to be anywhere else or with anyone else but these people at this time in the welcoming cafe. The moment in the plaza is enough and more. The beauty is almost overwhelming, yet somehow bearable. The sensation stays alive during some immeasurable period of time. But after a while, maybe an hour, there seems to be a reason to break the spell and they depart their cafe home and move on into the rest of their lives. The experience in the plaza lives on in his memory cells and will stay with him to be re-experienced over and over again, a new version each time. Sometimes he will long for this completeness like a lost part of himself. And once in a while, the present again, not something he can compel to appear or even capture in language, but like a special guest who occasionally drops by unannounced, something that could happen at any moment. Woo! Yay! Great job, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank I'm going to try my video. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Irene. And I do have something to read for uh, quickly. Um, I'm going to grab Irene's bio. And um, let me see here. I have it up. Here we go. Oops. Irene, did you send your bio in a different email? Let me just check here. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> I'm having a technical thing. Irene, I'm having trouble accessing my email while Zoom is working for some reason. Do you happen to have your bio in front of you? Irene, can you hear us? Irene had been on the phone, hadn't she? Yes, I, I do remember seeing her completely. Um, let me stop the share real quick so I can see. Um. Irene? Oh, I thought I just saw her. Yeah, I see her. I, I can't unmute her microphone. I think she has it muted. Okay. Irene, do you see on the left-hand side when you highlight the lower part of the screen? There's, uh, there you go. Okay. Got it. I was, I was muted by the host. Oh. But it was telling me. Okay. So, okay. Um, and I'd like to read your, I'd like to read your introduction then. Irene. Oh, okay. That's all right. I did. Right. Do, I was able to access it when we switched out of the full screen. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So please welcome Irene Edwards. She's a community activist, powwow organizer, American Indian culture presenter, powwow dancer, fine artist, writer, published poet, filmmaker, documentarian, screenwriter, bead worker, and backpacker. Irene Edwards is Pawnee and Cheyenne Indian who retired in, oops, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, uh, who retired in 2013 from a long career as an executive and administrative assistant. With a BA in psychology from Sant College of Santa Fe, a creative writing certificate and associate of arts in film from SFCC, Irene is currently working on a documentary film certificate and preparing a film short, a film, a film short from her screenplay. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I whittled it down from quite a bit. Um, so I'll go ahead and start reading. I've inserted pictures into a copy of this. And so I, I'll, there are seven images. And as I read, um, they'll show the other ones. Okay. Okay. After we attended, um, the title is My Grandma's Home. After we attended funeral services for an uncle in my hometown of Pawnee, Oklahoma, I drove by my grandma's old house where I'd spent a good deal of time while I was growing up. I took some photos and was struck by the reality that this was no longer a home. It was an empty shell. My grandma's home and up at Stu, up at is Pawnee for grandfather, was comfortable, inviting, relaxing, and safe. When you walked in, you felt a warmth that felt just like a hug. A pot of campfire coffee and food were always ready for any visitors who dropped by. You always had more than enough. The house had once stood at Coal Creek, my Uppets land north of Pawnee named after the creek that runs through it and which had belonged to his father. After moving to town, my grandparents sold the house and the new owners later moved it into town. Ironically, we lived just around the block um, in a rented house that was painted pink of all things. In 1964, the Pawnee received $7 million for a land claim which paid the Pawnees for our ancestral lands in Nebraska territory. My grandparents bought the house back. My grandma, my grandma was happy to be living there once again in the home where she raised her children 
and where her grandchildren and great-grandchildren came to stay and visit. My grandma's home was full of love, life, laughter, full of family, tradition, and history. On the wall were photographs of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and the old ones. Other things on the wall were old fancy birthday cards, dried flowers, and a U.S. Olympic certificate stating that my Aunt Bertha's nephew had run in the Olympic trials in the 1930s. My grandfather passed away 14 years before my grandma. He was a painter at the local trading post, making and painting small drums and teepees for which he had created the design. The trading post then sold them and other curios to touristy curio shops and trading posts in the Southwest. Up at set grandma's gardens measured the rows, tilled it, and then it was a family affair to plant the seeds. I recently discovered that my grandpa had graduated from Bacon College with a fine arts degree. In spring, thunderstorms were right outside our window, but we felt safe and secure from the storms. For grandma's garden, the tomatoes, pawnee corn, beans, squash, pumpkins, other vegetables, and flowers, such as peonies and petunias, the rain was welcomed. Huge paper shell pecan trees were building, were budding, excuse me, their spring green leaves starkly contrasting in the rain against dark black bark. In summertime, the house smelled of freshly laundered sheets just brought in from the clothesline. No man-made product can duplicate that scent. Grandma had a washer but no dryer, so she hung out towels, sheets, and clothes, and we helped, of course. It was a lot of work, but she was a hard worker. She did the household work and had worked outside the home for a while. Fall at Grandma's was enhanced by smells of old leather, furniture, old leather furniture, corn soup, Pawnee pumpkin bread, and pecan and apple pies. Picking pecans was a big part of fall, and we would head to Coal Creek to spend all day picking pecans. Harvesting was another hard job, and Grandma canned pretty much everything that we did not eat right away. We roasted the corn outside in the old Pawnee way, which brought a clean, crisp, sweet corn smell into the house to be prepared for drying. On any given cold winter's night, inside was toasty, especially when sleeping under heavy quilts made by Grandma. Grandma loved to bake, and winter brought us her orange cranberry bread. Once while she was baking, snowflakes outside fell gently onto cedar branches, building a blanket of snow upon each bough. At Christmas time, a native tree brought the fragrance of cedar inside, adding to the ambiance of the holidays. We would arrive on Christmas Eve in time to go to church, where my children's eyes would light up as they spied presents under the church's tree. These were special times for them with the aunt they loved so much. Grand's home saw many birthday celebrations, dinners, prayer meetings, and wakes. At prayer meetings, those old ones would speak in our language, pray, sing, and testify to the person needing help, support, or encouragement. Afterwards, they would all enjoy a potluck meal and a good pot of coffee. Before funerals, our deceased would be kept at home with the family until the final morning. People sat up with the family, told stories, ate, drank coffee, just to be there with the family on the last night. Whether sad or happy times, uncertain or wonderful times, Grand's home held many mem memories. In September 1989, devastating news came from my aunt. My grandma had inoperable liver cancer. I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. My aunt lived in Uluga and with my mom, kept my grandma the last three months of her life. 
them being nurses, they gave grandma great care. Every weekend, my children and I drove two and a half hours from where we lived to be with Gran, trying to be normal. Sometime before Gran passed away, a prayer meeting was held for her at her church in Pawnee, where she lived. We arrived at Grandma's home before going to the church. I watched my grandma open the car door, walk around to the front yard, get on her knees, and kiss the ground. I will never forget that. My grandma died on my Uppets birthday in December 1989. So on this day, it broke my heart to see my grandma's lovely home standing in its dilapidated state. This simple yet grand home to me with its overground, overgrown cedars, yard of leaves, dry leaves and tall grass with a broken window held nothing of its former life. Memories of being inside the house reside within me with my children and in the photographs of happy time when we all gathered for holidays, birthdays, and weekend visits with my grandma. God bless my grandma's home and whatever it will become, whether reincarnated or raised, it had a good long life and sustained generations of us generously for at least 10 decades. It gave us shelter. My grandma gave it love. All this came from looking at one of the photographs taken that day of my grandma's home. Thank you so much, Irene. Thank you. Y'all are killing it today. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Well, we have Robin next. Uh, let's see. I'll see if I need to unmute her since there have been some problems here. Thank you for trying that. Yeah. <laughs> Try my video again. Robin, your mic should be on now. It okay, looks like thank, it is. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Robin. Let's see here. I know that you, I don't know why I'm having this trouble. Let's see here. So, Robin, would you like to? Briefly share. Okay, wait one second. Here we are. So, Robin, Robin Ryder is a grandmother of seven, a tapestry weaver, and a world traveler who is using her journals to create a travel adventure book. Robin, thank you so much. This uh, little part of my future book is called The Primal Scream. After 10 months in the Peace Corps, working and living with the Luo tribe in Kenya, I saw my living arrangements start to unravel. I lived in a Christian conference center called Amani, which means peace in Swahili. The land had been donated by the surrounding clan many years before to the Church of England in hopes of bettering their lives <clears throat> by development projects, employment, and education. However, after constant poverty added to the jealousy of other tribal members, and especially after constant corruption both by the church and the local clan of Luos, there was a small revolt of sorts. The locals had been asking for more power to make decisions and control the money flow. I had been away for six weeks at a couple of Peace Corps conferences. I returned to see Maasai warriors standing on one leg, lean and fierce, leaning on their spears, red checkered blankets folded over their shoulders, guarding the conference center and watching over the teachers who were there for an HIV AIDS educational conference. While I was gone, the treasurer and the chairman of the board had written themselves a hefty check from a Bread for the World donation in the bank, 
and bought a truck. They were local Luo tribesmen, but other members of the group, and especially the church lady back in England, were quite upset. The church reacted by freezing all funds left in the bank and taking the development project 20 kilometers away to another school and different clan to build a new center there. The locals reacted by putting the chairman into his truck along with all his furniture and the social worker with whom he had been having an affair and expelled them from the compound. The wonderful folks that lived nearby were left with no jobs or church money for development. The place didn't feel right. It was becoming abandoned by all the staff for lack of wages. The pigs were left to forage for food, which broke my heart as there were no fields of corn, only dry weeds. Of course, the generator had no petrol for the, first, for the few lights powered by the solar battery. The center had emptied out of most its workers. The only one left was the old security guard, James. He had nowhere else to go and nothing else to do, so he just stayed guarding. He was old and tough and had once delighted in seeing a friend in me with our toenails painted with glow-in-the-dark polish, 20 toes with, which glowed phosphorescent in the black night. One night after a long and exhausting day of working with my young, men, <clears throat> my young men's group and their sm small business plans, and then adding on an HIV class, my, my Peace Corps friend Laura and I had sat for a long time in the front room. We were eating lasagna, spending a quiet evening chatting and watching the monkeys in the trees. The man must have gone into the second room entering from the porch while we sat and taken my backpack outside. He must have been crouched behind the bushes when I went outside to watch Laura walk through the trees to her new home on the compound. She had just relocated to my compound after a violent robbery at her last house a month before when an intruder had pushed open the gate and slashed her caretaker's head with a machete. When a volunteer is robbed, especially if it is violent, the volunteers moved away from her village and her work and made to start all over in a new place. I carried my red plastic tub outside to fill it at the large black water tank for my nightly bath. Only my headlamp was shining, but there was no other light anywhere on this empty Christian compound. I noticed the reflective tape on my backpack catching the shine from my headlamp. My brain did not want to recognize that my bag was over near the bushes, so I ignored the vision while my tub filled with water. But when I made myself step toward that place where the backpack was, a man jumped out from behind the bush. My headlamp reflected the small penknife that he held, and the light centered on the whites of his eyes, huge with fright. Everything else was a deep black color, the man, the sky, the earth. I screamed with terror, a primal scream. The man fled and I ran inside, actually jumping out of my shoes in panic and locked the door. James, the old guard, came to see. He had been sleeping in the chair on the porch of the church lady's empty house next door to mine. James, the last loyal worker to stay and nowhere else to go. I asked James to get Laura, who had heard my screams. She had hoped that it was the screams of the local women mourning a death. We stayed all, talking all night while James sat on our porch. We knew that as soon as we told Peace Corps about the incident, we would have to move away, leave our projects and homes and live elsewhere. So we waited until the next day to call Peace Corps so we could say our goodbyes to our dear Luo friends. It was heartbreaking to us. We loved the Luo women and a few of the men. Friends came by to talk to us and I was able to give each of them a small gift, a pencil, a pen, a book, some snacks sent to me in a box from New Mexico. I was enriched forever by knowing and loving those good people and dismayed to have to leave. We were taken to Nairobi to the Central Peace Corps office and put there for three days in the first class hotel where we swam ate good food, and were counseled by a nun 
who lived in a different world from ours. She had not been frightened to her core by a robbery with a knife. I carried away a bit of PS PTSD, which makes me jump and scream when I'm approached from behind by someone else. I also gained a deep respect for the Luo people who face each day with strength and joy and a beautiful song and dance. And Okay, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Emily, I think you said Thomas is next, is that right? You're muted, Emily. I'm gonna unmute you in case it's sticking or something. All right, are you there, Emily? I'm totally here. Okay, <laughs> and Thomas is next, is that right? That is correct, and okay. um, I will introduce Tom Gleisner, or it's Gleisner, and oops, I'm sorry, I was actually, I'm going to, I hope that doesn't mess anything up. Um, Tom, Tom will read The Cynic, and with a degree of annoyed enthusiasm. So Tom will read, will now read his contribution, The Cynic, with a degree of annoyed enthusiasm. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Oh, let me see. Let me see if I can. I think it's muted again. Let me stop the share. Thomas. All right, unmute. There. All right, you there you're good. <laughs> All right, I know everyone is relieved. <laughs> the cynic. Hey. Okay, I'm a cynic. I'm the guy who knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Let's get that established right off the top. So there will be no doubt in your mind, dear reader, what this essay is about, what guidance you can draw from it, or what vision it might provide. I'm a cynic and so be it. So let's talk about a few of the prices I've observed. Let's begin with weddings. Here we are. Ain't it beautiful? There's flowers and ribbons and garlands and a runway, possibly made of satin, down which the bridal procession, the bride escorted by her father, will glide, usually to the strains of a string quartet playing Paco Bell's Canon in D major or that chestnut the Bridal Chorus from Wagner's Lohengrin, popularly referred to as Here Comes the Bride. Missing from this picture, the people. Ah, here they are. The bride, the maid of honor, and the bridesmaids. Lovely. To be chosen, to be asked, to be a member of the bride's wedding. Well, that's very special. It confers upon you the honor of being in the closest circle of friends with the bride. You're in. Trouble is, you often have to buy your own dress for the wedding, a dress, by the way, that was selected by the bride or the bride's mother, or sometimes even a wedding planner. The gown may be, likely not, a choice you would make for yourself if you were out shopping for a diaphanous, flowing, slightly pink or yellow or mint green gown that will have to be dry cleaned after each wearing, as if you will ever wear it again after this wedding is over. You could be at three or four or even 500 bucks for this thing. A privilege. And here, the groom, the best man and the groomsman. For some reason, these guys are usually off the hook for having to buy their tuxedos. They can rent their outfits instead of having to shell out their own dough, 
ostensibly because this will be the only time in a given year they will wear the thing, unlike the diaphanous flowing slightly pink or yellow or mint green gown that members of the bridal party have to buy. And of course the, well, what are they? Uh, congregants, attendees, an audience? I don't know. But anyway, let's say there's 20 men in this photo. Dollars to donuts, there's only about three of them who really want to be there. I think for most men, weddings are a drag. The reception can be fun if there's an open bar. And now for the main attraction, the bride. Beautiful, radiant, virginal. That's what all the white's about, right? The white gown signifies that the bride is a virgin. Well, for a cynic, that concept is low-hanging fruit, but I'm a practiced cynic and know how far to develop an idea. White is the color of virginity in our culture, and that's a fact which needs no further exposition. The metaphorical slant in this essay is the concept of prices, as stated earlier in this Oscar Wilde quote, so I'll stick to that. Who wants to give me a price range out there in the retail world for wedding gowns? Have you seen on the news those box store sales events where they fling open their doors and let in throngs of frantic buyers at 5 a.m. to buy wedding gowns at huge discounts? Most of those buyers are women and one assumes they're all engaged. They practically knock down and trample the unfortunate person who unlocks the door. Get to those racks, all those wedding gowns for sale at low, low prices. Some greedily grab armfuls of the gown and head for checkout, while a few dreamers think they have time to sort through the selection assessing size and style. Forget about it. Grab something and make it work because anyone who attends your wedding will compliment the gown and will say how beautiful the bride is and so forth. Actually, from my cynical perspective, these box store buyers have precisely the right attitude about which gown to choose because really, they all look the same, don't they? Let's get out of the box store and go to the other end of the scale, the bridal shop. It's a nod to the cynical characteristic of characterization of a wedding as love's funeral. I'm tempted to refer to the business shown here as a shroud shop. But this fool will decline to rush in where angels fear to tread and stay away from any disparagement of the institution of marriage. We're talking about weddings here, not marriage. This shop is in downtown Santa Fe, and big surprise, I've never been in there. I didn't do one smidgen of research for this essay, so I don't know what this place charges for a gown, but I bet the proprietor can hook you up with someone who will be more than happy to sell you a gown for $10,000 or $20,000. Can you imagine dropping 20K on something you're going to wear once? Yep, wear it once, then send it to the dry cleaners, which can also vacuum pack it so you can have your $20,000 gown in a box up in the attic for the rest of your life. If by chance your marriage doesn't last, you can pull your gown out of its hermetically sealed box and use it for your next attempt as if. Uh-oh, might be stepping on toes here. Best to go on to my next target, the Cathedral Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. Now hold on, don't get your dander up. I'm not about to rip into the church or religion or anything else which will get me on any number of shit lists. If I was flirting with danger on weddings, then I've just wandered into a minefield. I'm a cynic, yes, but I'm not crazy, 
And even though religion in general is rich, loamy soil for the cynic, I'm not going there. Instead, I'd like to talk about the namesake, uh, the saint that is the Basilica's namesake, St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of animals. And I'd also like to talk about a peculiarity of the Cathedral Basilica itself. Here we see St. Francis in a typical depiction with birds perched on his hands. The birds are certainly not afraid, afraid of St. Francis, nor are they put off by his halo. St. Francis loved animals, was kind to them, and they had no fear of him. No, that's not a cigarette in his mouth. Here we see St. Francis in one of several representations in and around Santa Fe. Again, he's befriending animals, this time a large rodent, most likely a groundhog. The groundhog likes St. Francis and St. Francis likes the groundhog, just what you'd expect from the patron saint of animals, interspecies harmony. Here he is again. This statue stands in front of the basilica and depicts St. Francis in the company of a wolf, normally a very wild animal, which here is totally at peace with the patron saint of animals. Oh yeah, there's a bird's nest on the ground just behind and to the viewer's right. The birds are totally unperturbed by either St. Francis or the wolf. Apparently, in addition to being well-liked by the animals, St. Francis exerts a calming effect. A tranquility comes over them. The predator-prey tension is relaxed. In fact, when, in fact, when St. Francis is around, it doesn't exist. Here's the Cathedral Basilica from another view. In this picture, we see Cathedral Park, which flanks the north side of Cathedral Basilica. It is lovely with green, well-maintained lawns, lots of shade trees for hot summer days, and comfortable benches to sit on. There are two walkways which traverse both the length and breadth of the park, inviting one to come in. Take a stroll through on your way to your destination. Enjoy the park. And yes, there are animals here too. This sculpture, honors the history of Santa Fe in New Mexico and the Spanish and the animals that helped make it all possible. Integral, <clears throat> integral to this monument, the animals represent the foundation upon which all the efforts of man rest. There's a cow and a pig and a donkey, and on the opposite side, out of view, a sheep. Above these four animals, two horses appear to be leaping out of the sculpture. They're kind of hard to see in this picture, so here's a better one. So enough with the animals already. Everybody gets it. St. Francis was cool with animals. He and they had a thing. So how do you explain this? Really? No dogs allowed? That's what it says, and the no is in all caps. They mean it. Keep your mud out of Cathedral Park, the very part, park that's part and parcel of the Cathedral Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi, this patron saint of animals, no dogs allowed. Every time we walk by this perfectly good park, my dog Webster stops. WTF, can we go in, he asks. No matter how many times we go by Cathedral Park and no matter how many times I read the sign to him, Webster can't read, he still doesn't get it. There's not another public park in Santa Fe that says no dogs allowed. Sure, there are thoughtless dog owners who don't pick up after their dogs, but they are few and far between. And even if there's an occasional pile, there's park maintenance someone who keeps this park looking this good, they can remove it when they see no other jobs in the, when they see to other jobs in the park. And most dog owners, such as yours truly, 
always pick up after their dogs. I'm sorry. And most dog, dog owners, such as yours truly, always pick up after their own dogs and often pick up messes that aren't even left by their dog. It takes two assholes to make a pile of dog shit in a public place. Just say it. The occasional jerk that doesn't pick up after their dog is not enough to close this perfectly good park to responsible dogs. Wherever the remains of St. Francis are, be they in a crypt or a grave, or even if he's nothing but dust, still, He's spinning like a lathe over that sign, no dogs allowed. The patron saint of animals has a park named after him and there are no dogs allowed. Webster's right, WTF. Well, I guess I've said enough, but true to the cynics code, I'll lay one last smart ass remark on you. And this one, I probably will step on some toes. Viewer discretion is advised. Two masks, which will make us all safer in these trying times. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Cynicism is a good stuff. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. All right, let's see here. We've got Phoebe next. All right. Oh, did we all clap? We did clap for Thomas. Yeah. Phoebe, would you like <laughs> to introduce yourself? Okay. I think I'm out. Um, all right. Most afternoons, my husband and I take a walk in the hills outside of Santa Fe. The trails in the hills have no end. There's no top, no peak, no hard stop. They meander along the ridge line. If you hike long enough, most of these trails end up back where you started. But as you meander through these hills, the trails give way to different vistas. They are the serrated lines of the Ortiz Mountains with the Sandia Mountain looming large behind it the wall of snow and ice that make up the Jemez Mountains with the snow-capped mountaintops interspersed here and there, and the four figures that make up the Cerrillos Hills, like a child's attempt of a mountain. Then there's the lone point in a sea of desert. What do they call it? The tit? Sometimes the snow-filled sangre de Cristos are visible, but usually they are, are obscured behind a row of hills. The shapes of the mountains are so distinct. I look at the mountains and I'm reminded of the relief maps of elementary school. I want to trace the tops of the mountains with my fingertips. I want to paint them. I want to replicate them out of paper mache. I want to imprint the shapes into my mind so I always know which way is east, west, north, south. Sometimes when I walk these hills, I'm overcome with memories, memories of time spent in the mountains. When I was a child, we used to go to King Valley in the high peaks region of the Adirondacks. One summer, my parents rented a house at the El Sable Club. <clears throat> it was a yellow house. It was right next to the bowling green where we played a game like bocce ball on the lawn. The screen door would slam shut as we came and went. My mom didn't seem to mind. There were a lot of other kids around, and so we came and went throughout the day. Most mornings, I went on a hike with a group. You signed up to hike a particular mountain, depending on your age and skill level. While I wanted to hike as many as I could, I stayed away from the big ones. I wasn't a super athletic kid, but I enjoyed hiking these little mountains. We would bring a brown bag lunch, usually peanut butter and jelly, after hiking for an hour or so, we would reach the top of the small mountain and eat our lunches. Sometimes we'd pick blueberries on the top. After climbing down the mountain, we would hang out in the lodge, playing games. It was the last summer my parents were together. Maybe that's why I have such fond memories, or maybe it was a perfect place for me. There were a lot of other kids around. 
I was 11, almost 12, and relished the freedom of being able to come and go as I pleased. Normally, we lived in the suburbs of New York on top of a hill. It was a long walk to my friends' houses. This was a time before my parents, this was a time before parents arranged playdates and drove their children around. I also remember that my sister and I got along well that summer. Maybe there was just the right mixture of kids. Most of the time, my presence annoyed my sister. I was almost two years younger, but we were only one grade apart. When I was in sixth grade and my sister was in seventh, my school put on the play, Oliver. A boy in my sister's class was cast as the Artful Dodger. I was cast as the mini Artful Dodger. It was a made up part, but I was thrilled. The Artful Dodger was the coolest part, and so the mini Do Artful Dodger was the second coolest. When my sister found out that I was cast as the mini Dodger, mini Artful Dodger, she told that boy, now you can see what it's like to have her follow you around. I was so mortified, but it didn't stop me from being the best mini artful dodger ever. Besides, she had a crappy part. She had to play some mean old fat man selling orphans on the street. Aside from my older sister and I, I have a younger sister. She's four years younger than I am and a brother who's four years older. In addition to my parents, we had a mother's helper that summer. But in my memory, it was just my older sister and I that particular summer and a whole lot of kids our same age. The All Sable Lake wasn't close to the lodge. I seem to remember taking an old school bus down to the lake, down a dirt road. There were even a few gates. The driver had to get out of the bus and open the gate, drive through, then get out again to close the gate behind him. I guess it wasn't very hot that summer because we didn't go every day and I don't remember swimming any place else. There was a lower lake and an upper lake. I can't remember which was which. At the lower lake, I think they were rowboats. They called them guy boats. They were large wooden boats with oars instead of paddles. I knew how to canoe, but these boats were hard to maneuver. I wasn't used to rowing. They were kept in a boathouse. I remember struggling just to get the boat off the rack. They were so long and wide and heavy. It was so dark in the boathouse, especially after being in the bright sunshine. I remember the sounds of the water lapping against the boathouse <clears throat> as we pulled the boats down from the racks. The water was black. Was that the summer we went to the Janeway's family camp? I'm not sure if it was that summer or not, but I think it was. To get to the Janeway's camp, you had to row a guide boat across the entire lower lake. It was full of your food and gear. Once you arrived at the end of the lake, you had to carry all your food and gear and the boat to the upper lake. I wonder how far it is between the lakes. In my mind, it was at least a mile. Portage, that's what they call it. So once you portaged your boat and your gear to the upper lake, you had to row to your camp. The, Ad the Adirondack camps are pretty spectacular. There is no electricity, but there are separate cabins for eating and sleeping. This particular camp had a cabin that was just the kitchen and dining room. It was pretty open with large windows with screens and a fireplace. There were oil camps on the wall, oil lamps on the wall. There were also a couple of sleeping cabins, a bunkhouse for the kids and a cabin for the grown-ups. In addition to the cabins, there was a lean-to you could hike to that overlooked the lake. I was too scared to stay there overnight, but I remember hiking there after dinner one night and seeing the moon shining on the lake below. I remember laying down on the floor of the lean-to and smelling the balsam fir. That's it. Thank you. Great job, Petey. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next. Let's see, I just wanna see, did Josie, did Josie come by? Does anybody see Josie's name anywhere or Noah's? I don't see that name and I don't see a Noah. All right, then perhaps we are, uh, perhaps we have our final reader then. Um, and our final reader is Linda. Are you there, Linda? I've unmuted myself. Hi, I'm here. Yes, hi. Linda. Hi. hi. When I signed on, it didn't give me uh, the option to ha pick a video. I just came on with a black screen. 
But I, I've been on the whole time. Really? So if you want to turn on your video, you can uh, take your mouse over to the left corner of the screen and start video. Yes. Oh, I thought that was to like record or something. There no. I am. We can I see you. <laughs> okay. Um, also, I want to add that during this hour or so, uh, my computer has been going in and out and freezing up. So hopefully we can make it through the whole reading without me being disconnected um, okay, we might turn off your video if it starts to do something strange because sometimes the video okay. affects that just so you know okay, okay. robin <clears throat> i'm oh there you are okay linda do you want to introduce yourself yes because i didn't send you a bio or anything a -okay. um so i have uh spent the majority of my life uh, both in Santa Fe and New Mexico, Albuquerque. So um, I am a local, I am a native, um, and so I've been here a long time, <laughs> right? So these are, my story is called, Some Things I Remember About Living on the Ranch. When my dad was a young man, he helped a man named Wendell Hall build the fences around the 160 acres Mr. Hall had homesteaded south of town. Then years later, Mr. Hall, his wife and daughter were going to Alaska to live for five years. He asked my mom and dad to come out and live on the place and take care of it for them. They agreed and we moved out to the ranch. I was about 12 years old, my brother 13. I remember P.O. Box 4484 was our mailing address with a little post office on Cordova Road where what the cat dragged in is now. I remember learning to drive the old blue Chevy pickup truck with the running boards on the dirt road on the way home from town. And I remember the fun I had driving the red World War II Jeep across the open land knocking down Choyas. I remember my mother coming home and telling us she had seen a large rattlesnake up by the cattle guard and had taken the hoe and chopped it into pieces. My brother and I rushed up to see and the pieces were still moving and wriggling. I remember learning to saddle up the horse, Rusty, an old rodeo horse, and taking the dogs and riding south toward open land. One day I met a man out by one of the windmills used to water the cattle and he warned me about bringing the dogs as they put out coyote poison and the dogs might find one of those. This was in the mid 1950s so no conservation wasn't around yet. I remember I had a girlfriend who lived up the Arroyo Hondo and she would ride her horse down and I would ride Rusty up and we would meet and ride together. My dad had taught me when I was putting on the saddle to knee the horse in the belly and then pull the strap up as tight as you can. Otherwise, the horse takes a deep breath and when you get on the saddle, it slips down and you fall off. I remember the old guy who lived up the hill behind us and he had pigs. When the wind blew right or wrong, the smell of the pigs would waft down on us. I remember we had a windmill and if the wind blew especially hard, dad had to go out and shut the windmill off so it wouldn't pump so much and break. We had a well that gave lots of good water. I remember we had a garden and fruit trees. The peaches were really good except they had a fuzz on them that made my face itch until I learned to wash them off. I don't remember tending to the garden. I think my parents did most of the work as well as have a business in town. I remember we had chickens and plenty of eggs. My mom probably took them into town along with the milk from the cow. My parents got a Jersey Guernsey milk cow when we moved out to the ranch. I remember that they always had to be home in the morning and the evenings to milk the cow. We couldn't go on vacation. They had to milk the cow. 
I remember the little kittens born to the blind cat mittens would get squirted with the milk. And they were born in the little barn that doubled as the milking shed. I still have the milking stool they used. I remember when the baby chicks got big and started to become roosters and hens. My parents decided to dress the young males and put them in the freezer. I can remember the day vividly. Lined up, there were two large tubs of real hot water. These were to plunge the dead chickens into to loosen the feathers to make them easier to pluck. Then there was the chopping block where dad would separate the head from the body with a swift swing of the hatchet. He would then let the body of the chicken run around spewing blood until it fell down. My brother and I thought that was very funny. Then he would pick it up and hang it upside down to bleed out. Then my mom would dunk and pluck and gut and make ready for the freezer. I don't remember me or my brother being of much help in all this, except to go retrieve another rooster. I remember one Christmas, my brother and I did not get any toys or games, only clothes, blue jean jackets and a badminton set. We vowed never to be toyless at Christmas again. We went outside and played with a badminton set. When I had kids, I always made sure there was something to play with on Christmas morning, even when they got to be bigger teenagers. I remember riding my sled down the hill behind the house and hitting my head on a low flying pinion branch. Ouch. I remember the time I was on Rusty and had Julie, the young filly, on a rope. Mom and dad were out doing something in the field and the Jeep was parked nearby. As I was going around the Jeep, Rusty went one way and Julie went the other way and I went down onto the license plate and it cut a gash in my right leg. That scar was there for years. It traveled up my leg as I grew and has now disappeared. I remember in the spring when the snows would melt and the lowest part of the road would fill up with mud. Dad would wait until it froze and then drive a car across and park it so we would have a way to get into town in the morning. I remember missing a dance in town with my new cute boyfriend because we couldn't get into town and no one would come out to pick me up. I remember I cried. I remember riding the bus home from school. We were the last ones to be dropped off. It went down Old Santa Fe Trail, down Zia, and out South Galisteo. We still had about a quarter mile to walk from on top of the hill, down the road and down to our house, the last one. The old road actually continued on south to the town of Galisteo, that being only two ruts since no one used it anymore. I remember wearing my new red coat with the hood and how elegant I felt and warm against the wind. I remember dad taking us down to the Arroyo and putting cans and bottles on the side of a little cliff. Then he would find a good spot a ways back and have me and my brother shoot the 22 rifle and hit the cans. I was a pretty good shot and learned to shoot in the Arroyo. They let my brother use the BB gun and shoot at the pinon jays that came around the fruit trees. I remember being late for first period because the cow or the horse got out of the fence and we had to go get her. The teacher would get so upset, I would have to stay after school and write, I will not be late for school 100 times on the blackboard. Then the next day I would be late again for a different but perfectly good reason. I couldn't help it, it was not my fault. I remember that first period teacher was Mr. Salvador. Eight dogs, three horses, and a cow. I remember frozen blue jeans on the clothesline and a ringer washer with three tubs where mom did the wash. I remember the bunkhouse where my brother and I had our bedrooms and a little bath with a toilet and shower. 
My mother would build a fire in the little pot-bellied stove for the hot water. I remember putting the clothes through the wringer and then swinging the wringer around to do the next tub. After the clothes were washed and rinsed, she would carry them out to the clothesline to dry. Then they would have to be ironed, in parentheses. Years later, some hippies asked my mother why she used the washer and dryer instead of hanging them out the natural way. I think you know what she said. I remember finding old magazines in boxes from the 1940s and the early 50s with odd advertising and articles. Apparently, the Russians were our friends with articles about the poor Russian peasants and how hard the war was on them and how they or their winter stopped the Germans. Interesting how the poor peasants somehow became the red menace of later years. <clears throat> I remember putting up pictures of my teenage heartthrobs on the wall next to my bed. I would kiss Ricky Nelson goodnight so much the paper was worn away. I remember sitting on the side of one of the hills a short way from the house and looking south across the valley of the Arroyo onto the plains of flat land and grass to the mountains in the distance. It was bare, open, empty land. I suddenly had a vision of houses, roads, people and cars, development on the open land along the Arroyo. It was horrifying. I'm sad to say that my vision of long ago has come to pass. All around the town has been developed and continues to do so. The Halls moved back after three years and we moved into town. I think that my parents were relieved to be rid of so much responsibility. Now, when I think back on those days, I see how hard they must have worked to have kept things running smoothly and how oblivious I was. But whatever hardships there were, it was one of the best three years of my life. That's it. <clears throat> Great job. Great gonna, job, Linda. Thank you. Unmute everyone now. I think um, people have come into the meeting all muted. So I'm unmuting everyone. So if you want to mute yourself, I believe that is now in your control and you can unmute yourself too if you want to say something. Okay. I, I would like to say thank you, Linda, and thank you, everybody. I am just, um, we have such a special class and at such an unusual time, uh, unprecedented time. Um, fairly. And uh, I want to applaud each of you for working so hard <clears throat> and for staying connected to your writing and staying connected to our class. And it has been an incredible gift for me personally to be able to have um, such a joyful opportunity to hear your creative work and to be a part of this unique time together and have a community together in our class. So I'm so honored and I'm so grateful. And I just think you all did an excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank it you. was fun. Hey. Everybody did a great job. Yes. I loved everybody's stories. They're all just fabulous. And thank you so much to all of you who joined us today for the reading. And, um, and thank you, Val. There you are. Thank you so much for hosting this reading. Thank you, Val. Thank you. I want to ask Val and Emily, though, uh, I had to log on to this via the SFCC uh, web page, I mean, main page, uh, rather than like my flamingo at yahoo.com internet page, which is a lot easier for me to get on than having to go to the student side and then uh, Canvas and then daily, you know what I mean? I do. Uh, it was kind of complicated for me to get here. Mm -hmm. And then I kept losing the internet. I was like, yeah, what's well, I, you yes. Know? But you I know, find that if I come on through my flamingo at yahoo.com, then it, it's, I don't have as many problems. You see what I mean? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I Maybe you and I can kind of poke around and see where the 
the um, yeah. funny things are happening. Maybe we can do that tomorrow. Well, for- also when I went to the uh, the the school site, the day of the um, assignment for today kind of thing, mm-hmm. it had the Zoom address, but I it wouldn't link to it, right? So I had to copy it https dot dot slash slash the whole thing. You know, and then it asked me to put in the password, you know. And so it was a little, that's why I was late coming on. I kept trying to find you. Mm. Well, we've had, I mean? we've had some problems with um, hackers coming into our Zoom meetings. So we've had to change the meeting protocols at the very last minute. Um, trust me, it's better to have these problems than to have really rude and crude people coming on and ruining everything for us. So yeah. it was a hurdle for you, but we're really just trying to protect our community. Okay. Well, I guess if it's a class Hi, event, I'm not coming to the class. Thank you, everyone, so much. Well, thank for you. It was so great to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. great job. Good to see you. everybody. See you tomorrow in class, okay? Yeah. Oh, are we having class tomorrow? I thought we might. We're having class tomorrow? <laughs> Thank you, Val. Oh. Thank okay. you. Okay. Join us. Thank you, Val. Thank you. See you tomorrow.